والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. My topic, as you have already heard, is feminism from an Islamic perspective, or Islam and feminism. And this term, feminism, we hear regularly in the newspapers, on television, in the media, magazines, etc. It has become one of the hot topics of our time. It's a topic which came up in the 20th century and it has carried on into the 21st century. And it's a topic which represents in the hands of some an attack on Islam or the basis from which Islam would be attacked. However, Feminism in its origin was not against Islamic teachings. It is what feminism has become in our times where we find it challenging and seeking to displace Islamic teachings in the Muslim Ummah, the female element of the Muslim Ummah. So for us to understand this topic, let me first give you a definition. The definition found commonly is that feminism is the belief in the social, economic, and political equality of the sexes. The social, economic, and political equality of the sexes. This is the, es the essence of what women, Western women in particular, were fighting for for the last three to five hundred years. The social equality which had to do with family and how family operated, economic, which had to do in the workplace, wages, and equality of pay for equality of work. And in the political sphere, it was focused on voting because up until 1920, in the U.S., there wasn't an opportunity for most Americans or American females to vote. Voting was the right only of males. But by 1920, 1918 in the U.K., women were given the right to vote. And with that right, they progressed with the civil rights issues of the 20th century, where black Americans sought their rights, which were supposed to have been given to them. And the women's movements, women's rights movements, they followed up behind the civil rights movements in the U.S. Now, when we look at the issues of feminism, we have to understand that feminism in the West is quite different from what many of you might think feminism is as Muslims. Because the background, the history which produced feminism 
in the in the west is different from the background for muslims because if we consider that 1400 years ago in the 7th century prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had stated in his farewell address khutbatul wida he had said there in that khutbah ya ayyuhan nas ala inna rabbakum wahid o people your lord is one wa inna abakum wahid and your father is one ala la fadla لعربيين على أعجميين. By Allah, there is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab. ولا لعجميين على عربيين or for a non-Arab over an Arab. ولا لأحمر أو أحمرة على Aswara, and there is none for whites over blacks. Wala li aswada ala ahmar, nor li for blacks over whites. Illa bittaqwa, except based on the fear of Allah. This statement 1400 years ago is a statement of civil rights, a statement of equality, which was only reached by Western civilization in the 19th and 20th centuries. So we have a different background. Our laws are divinely revealed laws revealed by the creator of this world and everything in it. Their laws, while initially based on the Bible, and the Bible is corrupted, it is not the pure revelation from Allah, so it has in it many, many statements which go against the teachings of God. But it does have a moral core which is preserved in Islam, in its purity. So with that corruption, then it was not surprising that in the West, Slavery was promoted. People of color were looked at as inferior to Europeans. And even in the most highly regarded document of America's existence the American Constitution in it and this is written in the 18th century by the leading thinkers the most enlightened leaders who put together this document known as the American Constitution in it in article 1 section 2 called the three-fifths compromise, it enshrines there the concept that people of color, black people, were equivalent to three-fifths of a white person. This is in the American Constitution. 
This is in the 18th century. And this was not repealed in the full sense until the 1960s with the civil rights movement when finally laws were made to ensure no discrimination uh, over race and added to that was also no discrimination for the sexes. So there is a different background here. Because the laws in Islam were revealed by God, those laws will not be evolving. They will not need to be changed. Not to say that in some parts of the Muslim world where culture has overcome the teachings of Islam that women may not have to fight for rights which were already given to them in Islam. So this is the perspective we are talking about. The, the rights which Western women fought over in the early 20th century, like owning property, this was already established in the Quran and the Sunnah 1,400 years ago. That khutbah or speech which Prophet Muhammad gave as his farewell speech 1,400 years ago, you will not find in any civilization from the 7th century all the way up until the 20th century where a clear statement of equality and opposition to nationalism and tribalism is there. You will not find it. No matter how hard you search in all of the European countries, countries of the Far East, Near East, it's not there. And the reason why it was there at a time when nowhere else in the world was this said is because it is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why it could be found 1,400 years ago when nobody in the rest of the world was thinking about this. It was not comprehensible. People were caught up in tribalism, in racialism, nationalism, etc., etc. So when we look at the issues of feminism, we have to look at them from this perspective. That Islam has already given us the foundations for women's rights. They're all there. Women's rights which benefit them, they're all there. There are some rights which Western feminism has introduced which are anti-family which are really anti-femininity, which promote lesbianism and other deviant behaviors and practices. This has become char chartered in the UN, in their women's conferences. These are being promoted. So when we look at uh, the, the mainstream feminism from the West, most of what is sought by them is supported by Islam. Equal Pay Act in 1963, they passed that. Islam is all for that. Whether it's males amongst males, white and black, or males and females, 
if both have done the same work, they deserve to get the same pay. So this is quite legitimate. Also, restricting jobs in the West, women were not allowed into certain professions. So Islam, that door is open. They are not restricted from where and when and how they would work in the society. If it's beneficial to the society, Islam is in favor of it. It doesn't oppose women uh, entering into various uh, fields of work, which may be even well known or commonly held by males. Islam doesn't say simply because males are normally in these fields, you can't. What you find is that it was not until the 1965 Race Relations Act that uh, followed also by the Civil Rights Act that women were now given the opportunity to take jobs as airplane pilots, uh, in construction workers, soldiers, bankers, bus drivers. They could do, take all these jobs. This was a revolution in the 60s. But really, Islam never prohibited women from taking these uh, professions. The bus drivers, you might say, but what about Saudi Arabia? Women are not allowed to drive there. Well, you know that some changes have taken place recently. But that's not Islamic's, uh, Islam's ruling on women driving. That's just Saudi Arabian culture. That's all that is, Saudi Arabian culture. It's not Islamic culture, Islamic law. And how you know in general what is Islamic law and what is Islamic culture is that culture is found in some places and not found in others. Whereas law is going to be everywhere. Like praying five times a day, it's everywhere in the Muslim world. We don't have any country which says pray three times a day. Fasting in Ramadan is law. Everywhere you go in the Muslim world, Muslims fast. They fast in the month of Ramadan. They fast for 30 days. Or 29 days. Nowhere do you find them fasting in Sha'ban instead of Ramadan. Nowhere. So you know this is Islam. But when you find things in one place. Practice for example here in Nigeria. But you go elsewhere. You don't find it. Then this is one of the signs that this is cultural. It's cultural. It's not really from Islam. So, important for us to understand the distinction between the two. So, as I said, much of what the early feminist movement in the West sought, Islam had either already provided or the opportunity to find it was there in Islam. So, when we look into certain practices, for example, we said the right to own property. Women in Islam had the right to own property 1,400 years ago. The right to education, which is one of the things that the feminist movement fought for in the 19th century. The right to education, we know that Aisha radiallahu anha was one of the leading teachers after and in the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We know that herself and Umm Salama they taught the generation to come the deen. Maybe one fourth of the Sharia was taught by them. So they had that position 1,400 years ago, no problem. Whereas in the West, women were denied education. They were not allowed to go and study. Back in the Middle Ages, they were even debating whether women had souls. Whether women 
had souls. Because they were generally holding the opinion that women were just created for the pleasure of men. And even the most enlightened thinkers of the uh, Renaissance period and the Enlightenment period, they had made horrendous statements about women. That they're frivolous, they're not, they're silly, they're not to be consulted, like these kinds of statements. So that's the tradition that uh, feminism in the West is coming out of. Actually, even in during the the uh, 18th century into the 19th century, early 19th century in Germany, men had the right to sell their wives. In Germany, men had the right to sell their wives to somebody else. I mean, this is something unthinkable in Islam that a man would have the right to sell his wife to somebody else. But that's what existed. And that's the view that they had of women. So you can understand that as women woke up in the West with the various uh, civil rights movements that were developing in France, in, in uh, Germany and England, etc., that they sought for those rights. They fought for those rights. So, as I said, what we have to keep in mind is when we look at issues, feminist issues, we have to keep in mind that our background is different from theirs. And when the countries of Europe and the West became secular countries, secular democratic countries, then even the moral principles which govern the society were lost. The moral principles which govern the society were lost because morality now was decided by the majority. Morality was decided by the majority of the citizens. So what was forbidden, considered evil, etc., 10 years before, 50 years before, what it was now considered good and fine. And what was considered good and fine before was now considered evil. And that's how the situation changes in the West. So you will find new issues coming in the feminist uh, movement which go against the understandings of the early feminists of the 20th century. So just as an example, we can look at the issue of what is called marital rape. Marital rape. In the 90s, 1993, it was made a crime punishable with jail in the U.S., and it spread across a number of countries in the world. Marital rape. Now, the reality is that according to Sharia, there is no such thing. There is no such thing as marital rape. Because when a husband and wife marry in Islam, there are rights which have been specified for the male and rights which have been specified for the female. And amongst the rights of the male is that if he calls his wife to have relations with him, she's supposed to come. And she marries under that basis. So the idea that she is going to say no 
and he forces himself on her and that now becomes a crime punishable with 12 years in jail. 12 years in jail. We can say, well, maybe, you know, he shouldn't have forced himself. If the force is coercion, non-physical, then still, should he be charged? If it's physical, he has beat her up, he broke an arm or whatever. Okay, we have an issue. This is now violence. And the punishment is not for marital rape, but for violence. For, for harming his wife. That's the point in Islamic law. But not rape in marriage. And in fact, though the West has taken it on and now it's become quite a standard... Some of the biggest countries in the world, China, there is no marital rape. India, there's no marital rape. Here, Nigeria, there's no marital rape. Biggest country here in, in Africa. Second biggest, uh, Ethiopia, Muslim population wise, general population wise. No marital rape. And a number of other countries around the world, Indonesia, uh, 300 million people, no marital rape. So this is something limited to a particular uh, part of the world with their view in terms of the male-female relationship. So what has happened is that feminism went from practical, uh, institutional, efforts to ensure women their fair, just, and equal rights into areas now which went beyond the boundaries of what was just fair and just. It now shifted into radical feminism which identified men as being the enemy. They talk about the patriarchal society. That the only way women are going to be truly free is if they divorce themselves from men. Practically. They, especially now with technology, women can have a baby without the direct intervention of a man. They have sperm banks where you just make the arrangements, you get it, and you can have a child. So, they say, we don't need men. Of course, they still need the men to provide the sperm. So, it's not that you don't need men, right? But the point is that even marriage now was being looked at as being a place of oppression of women. Because the idea that the man, you know, is the head of the family and all this, no. They looked at that as being oppression. So, they have launched an attack on the family itself. And this is what has now dominated the women's conferences that are connected with the UN, etc. The American and European uh, feminists, you know, they have dominated the discussion. Their main focus is on FGM, female genital mutilation, the veil, hijab. We need to liberate our third world sisters from the oppression of male dominated society. So that is their view. While women from the third world are concerned about things, practical things connect in their countries which have to do with national debt and health care and all these other kinds of things. Their main concern is contraception, sterility, you know, sterilizing the, the third world women so they don't have too many babies. You know, they say too many babies is affecting your economy, etc. So we need to cut down the number of babies Ooh, so that the resources, you know, last so that the West can continue to benefit from those resources. So this is their approach. This is their focus. This is their idea. 
So we have to be very careful when we connect ourselves with the feminist movement from the West. What most of the various groups are calling for go against the teachings of Islam. Now, there are a number of issues. I have listed about 17 of them which represent the areas where the West, being led by Western feminists, attack on Islam. The time doesn't permit me to go into all of them. You know, I can list them here. Polygamy, which was talked about earlier by my brother. Arranged marriages, which are forced marriages. Guardianship, you know, wilaya. Do you have to have a wali when you get married and this? Child marriages, what they call child marriages. Marrying non-Muslims. This is all women's issues. Divorce, it's easy. Man's right, he has the right. Women don't seem to have the right, you know. Marital rape that we, we, we spoke about. As well as issues of alimony, abortion, uh, contraception, the veil, inheritance, two witnesses, separate education. These are all topics which the West attack the Muslim world on in the name of feminism. What I would suggest to you, because time doesn't permit me to tackle all of this, what I would suggest to you is that these have been tackled already in a course called Contemporary Issues, which is available at my university website, Islamic Online University. This course in the free diploma, it doesn't cost you anything. Go there and take this course. They give you a certificate at the end of the course. These issues, which are hot issues of our time, which have to do with you as women, please take this course, take the benefit from it. It will help you in dealing with these various uh, issues which are being raised constantly in the media, etc. in the name of feminism. So, Inshallah, this presentation, Islam and Feminism, is really about distinguishing between what we may call Islamic Feminism and Muslim Feminism, cultural Muslim Feminism. Islamic Feminism is where a Muslim woman who knows her rights in Islam insists on her rights to get those rights, where those rights are not being given as they should. For example, female divorce, khula. Khula, where a woman has the right to initiate divorce. In most Muslim countries, it's very difficult, even though it may be on the law books, because it's in all of the schools of law, Islamic law, Sharia, the madhabs. It's there in every one of them. But because of decisions made at a point in history where the scholarship, Islamic scholarship, was at its low, this right to a large degree is denied Muslim women today. If they try to get it, it's so much going around and here, there, up, down, left, right, put this paper in, get that stamped, and all kinds of things till the end. You say, ah, it's not even worth it. This is unfortunate. Because in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, listen, I want to divorce my, my husband. And people say, well you, well, you have to have a good reason. She said, I don't like him. In fact, I find him ugly. Okay? I find him to be the ugliest of men. And it is affecting my iman. The Prophet Sallallahu informed the man and the divorce took place. By Khula. Of course, he asked her, are you ready to give back the dowry which he gave you, the mahar? She said, I'll give him back 
double. He said, no need, no need. Okay, just give him back what he gave you. So this is a right which women have the right to push for. That divorce should be initiated or initiatable from women. It should not only be in the hand of the man. And most women don't know that it's also possible in your marriage contract to put it as a condition that I have the similar right to divorce as my husband. So even without going the khula route, you can pronounce divorce as the husband pronounces divorce. You can seek it in your contract. Most women don't know this. What? Really? Yeah. <laughs> Shall. <laughs> so this is a uh, this is a part of Islamic law. But people are not informed that, so you don't know. So you are put in the position, you know, in many cases where it is extremely difficult for you to get out of, uh, you know, marriages which are harmful, even harmful to yourself. So Islamic feminism stays within the bounds of the Sharia. It doesn't seek what is contradictory or violating those principles. So if a woman, for example, she can't uh, conceive in her own womb, in the West, it's possible for her to either combine ovum from her womb, from her uh, fallopian tubes, combined with the sperm of her husband or the sperm of anybody else from a sperm bank and that combination put in the womb of another woman who becomes a surrogate mother and she has a child. From the Islamic perspective, this is not permissible. The only in, vir in vitro fertilization, IVF, uh, acceptable, format acceptable, is where the ovum of the woman is combined with the sperm of her husband and it is placed in her womb. That's it. If she can't bear a child in her womb, then she's patient. Adopt a Muslim child. That's possible too. Adopt that Muslim child. The Prophet ﷺ had said that Myself and the orphan are like this on the day of judgment. So find an orphan child and adopt them. But any other combination Islamically is not allowed. It's not acceptable. That child that grows, child of yours that grows in the womb of another woman, she's being nurtured by that woman, by all the things that are connected to it. That child is not really yours anymore. It's not really your child. And if you combine it with the sperm of another man, is it can't, how, how is your husband going to claim this is your child, his child? Can't. So it's very clear in this matter, though Prophet Muhammad did not speak on it directly, the Sharia has principles which ensure that only one form of IVF in which your fertilization is acceptable from the Sharia perspective. So, we need to know our limits. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا That in this way, we have made you, you Muslim females, we have made you a moderate middle nation not going to one extreme or to another extreme just in your practices righteous in your beliefs litakunu shuhada ala nas to be a witness to the rest of humankind because they're changing modifying going up and down left and right all over the place 
you become the witness for humankind of what a woman should be. What is the proper perspective of a woman in these times fulfilling her rights and fulfilling her duties. So Allah has made us in that way. So we should stay within the Sharia limits and avoid the extreme views of those who may be Muslims in name and culture but who don't have any problem with breaking the Sharia. Because as far as they're concerned, Muhammad Sallallahu was a male, a patriarch. And as such, he represents a part of the enemy. That's what it has come to. He be, represents a part of the enemy. And as a result, in Turkey and in Tunisia, they made uh, polygamy illegal. Polygamy was made illegal when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it permissible and the Prophet sallam reaffirmed it. They have gone and made it illegal in the country. And they're seeking other laws to ban uh, different Islamic practices with related relationship to women. So the West basically feminism functions according to the whims of the extreme movement today. There are some among them who are not to those extremes they do recognize the role of women in family and all this, you know, but they are a minority. The majority now who call themselves feminists are people who are anti-family. They're anti-family. Of course, you have the issue. You're out working, your husband's out working, but you have to come back home and cook the food, wash the dishes, everything else. He comes back home and rests. Well, if your husband is having you work, then he has to share in the housework. You know? If you choose to go out and work, he says, I'm not stopping you, but don't let your going out to work reduce your housework so you're not taking care of the home. Because it's not necessary for you. I have the means to look after both of us. So it's not necessary. But if you want to, I don't object. However, not at the expense of taking care of the home. Taking care of the children in the home. So that's the arrangement which can be worked out. And you make that arrangement accordingly. But if he's telling you, no, go on work because I don't have enough to take care of both of us. We need a second income. And this is in many cases like that today in these times. We need that second income. Then okay, if I'm going out to work, you tell him, lay. You know, don't expect me to come home after working, you know, nine to five, just like you. And then the first thing I come home, I have to be rushing to the kitchen and cooking this and that. And, you know, no, no. That's not fair. That's not just. You know? Yes, primarily that is your role. But once you have, the man has required the woman to shift out of her primary role and her primary role now becomes secondary. Her primary role now becomes the earning of income and the husband is benefiting from it. Then he has to make arrangements to have a maid or whatever else in the home to take care of that housework. That's fair. That's just. That's not Western feminist. It is just functional for us to be able to function in a fair way, in a just way, then that makes sense for us to be able to do that. So, again, just closing, 
because this is really, as I said, only an introduction to this topic. Inshallah, we plan to offer a course in gender studies. Uh, Professor Binta from BUK, uh, she has a center, alhamdulillah, there in Kanu, which is which focused on gender studies. She is going to be working with my university, the Islamic Online University, as well as Professor Zinat Kauthar from the International Islamic University in Malaysia. The two of them are putting together a curriculum for certificate, diploma, and degree courses in gender studies. Because we do need to have women who are thoroughly grounded in this field to be able to speak on behalf of Muslim women. I shouldn't be the one up here speaking. This is your issue, primarily. And I'm sure among you there are those who can express this far more eloquently than I do. I'm just a substitute. But we need to see more and more women step up and take this on and become spokespeople. Because when the West sees this, they say, see, the men, this is a woman's issue and it's men telling the women. No, it needs to be women telling the women. Women discussing with the women. So I encourage you to uh, join the Islamic Online University and access the knowledge that is available because your future is going to depend on your current knowledge. You need to have a thorough uh, knowledge about the deen, first and foremost. When the Prophet ﷺ had said, Talabul ilmi farid Allah kulli Muslim, seeking knowledge is a religious obligation on every mu Muslim. That's male and female. Equally an obligation on both, according to their ability. So this is a responsibility for the sisters of Jannah, for you to achieve that goal of Jannah, you must have correct Islamic knowledge. It is what will guide you with the skills that you already have to be in true service to the Ummah. To truly be sisters of Jannah, to help other sisters get to Jannah, and for you to get to Jannah yourselves. So please, sisters, make that commitment today. It is something which each and every one of you can do. Studying online doesn't require you to stop doing what you're doing and starting something else. Studying online means right at home, while you're doing housework, etc. Or even when you're working outside of the home, in your spare time, studying, improving on your knowledge, inshallah, sharing that knowledge, and inshallah, we will have a brighter future for the Muslims, and especially the Muslim sisters of Nigeria in the years to come. Barakallah feekum, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The question, just to rephrase it, that a woman was raped and she found herself pregnant. She didn't want to deliver the child. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, according to Islamic law, if she has reached the end of the fourth month, and that is the point at which the soul is breathed into the fetus. Now the fetus becomes a human being in the full sense. If it's reached that point, then she should not abort. If it's before that point, then it is permissible for her based on her being raped to abort the child. But it would be recommended for her to carry the child to term and 
give the child away uh, rather than abort. So abortion has been ruled permissible by many scholars on this matter, like in Bosnia back in the early 90s when they were Muslim women were raped by the Serbians. Many of them, they did it deliberately. They became pregnant. And this was a trial for them because they would not be accepted even by their own society. But because of that, scholars ruled that it is permissible in those early stages to abort them. Okay, that's the first part. The second question. The second question is about um, early marriage in Islam. Yeah, I just want you to talk about it based on um, the health implications you have. Young girls, a lot of. Um, I didn't catch that. Early marriage? Yeah, early marriage, yes. In Islam. Early marriage is recommended by the Prophet. Yes. He instructed both males and females, uh, youth, that they should marry early. Obviously, in these times, you need the support of your parents. You know, because uh, if you're still under the um, guardianship of your parents, uh, you're still in school, they're paying for you, etc., then their support would have to be there for you to be able to get married early. Yeah. Why I ask this, because of the health implications of, my, of a young girl getting married and conceiving. That's why I ask what ruling would that be because of the health implications? Most times that we have now, the trend is common. You have a young girl conceive, she's pregnant, she can't conceive, she dies. So what ruling, at what age do you, would you say um, children of nowadays should marry, should be married off? That's why. I mean. We can't fix numbers. This may vary from, from one female to the next, you know? If the society sees that there's harm in early marriage before a certain point, they can fix an age. The society can do it. But, you know, as a scholar making a fatwa, we can't put a number on it. That can be decided by the community because they will know what represents the age at which that it would be detrimental to that young lady to get married at. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Al Basharat Aremu. I'm from uh, Kaduna State SOG branch. My question is uh, What's the Islamic ruling of female circumcision? Is it Sunnah or not? Thank you. Um, oh, female circumcision. Female circumcision uh, is permissible if it is done uh, very uh, lightly. The way to determine what is light and what is not, that the impact of that cutting is no more than the impact of male circumcision. So they're not cutting any parts of the woman which deny her the full uh, pleasure from sexual relations. So as long as it's kept down to that minimum, because the Prophet ﷺ was informed about a woman in Medina who was doing that, and he told her to make it very light. Khafidi, make it very, very light. So how do you define what is light? As I said, we know in the case of the male, when uh, circumcision is done, this doesn't affect. Hello? Bismillah. Yeah, it does, what doesn't affect him, what is similar for a woman which doesn't affect her would be permissible. Anything that is going to affect her ability to uh, enjoy the sexual act, uh, we say is Islamically not acceptable then it becomes what we call uh, female genital mutilation. All right, good afternoon. My name is Ramatu Aliyu, and uh, my question is, is it allowed for a woman to donate her ovaries to another woman who is seeking for the fruit of the womb? Like, I have no, a No, it's not permissible. 
This is the case that we spoke about earlier where we're talking about sur surrogate motherhood. The only acceptable form is the, is the ovum of the woman combined with the sperm of her husband and placed in her room. If it's placed in somebody else's room or it's uh, sperm of other than her husband or ovum of other than herself, it's not acceptable Islamically. Okay, the medical condition is that the lady is not producing eggs and she wants her sister to, do, to give her eggs so that... Not allowed. Okay. Because that those the eggs that her sister uh, gives, which is fertilized by her husband is, and producing a child, that child is not her child. Even if the, the child is, is raised in her own womb, it's still not her child. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Safiya Mustafa from Kano's Dun. My question is, what does Islam say about oral sex? What does the Quran say about oral sex? It says, Fatu harthakum anna ashittukum. You can come to your wives, wives to their husbands, as they wish. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Maryam Abu Bakr by name. Please, my question goes like this. Does court wedding, is it welcome in Islam? Is the? Court wedding. Court, court, court. wedding. Yes. A uh, court wedding which is in an Islamic court is an Islamic marriage. A court wedding done in a non-Muslim court following non-Muslim procedures is not considered to be marriage from the Sharia perspective. Alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We talked about, you talked about um, in a situation where a woman cannot bear a child. You know, that's a child in orphanage home. But from my child, Bismillah. I, I cannot hear you. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I was saying that you talked about adopting a child in a situation where a woman cannot be a one. But from my understanding, the first thing I know is that the child, the adopted child, cannot bear the name of the adopted father or the man that adopted her. True. That's one. Then two is that if it's a girl, in fact, either way, it's a girl, the father cannot be, father is not in Mahram to her. That's the adopted father now, or the father that adopted the child. That, be will, Mahram. that will depend on the age of the child. If she was adopted at a time when she was still breastfeeding, and the mother was able to, or the sister who adopted her was able to feed her her breast milk, then she would become a suckling daughter. But sir, if she could not even deliver, definitely she wasn't the person that breastfed her. So if she did not breastfeed her, that means that she, the man can be a mahram to her. And if he's a boy, the mother can also be a mahram. I think he cannot be a mahram to the mother. I don't know if you get my... Yeah, I understand. I understand. But it, what it's going to mean is that uh, when they reach puberty, then they have to observe the requirements of hijab. Simple as that. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ, he made an exception where he had the wo a woman uh, give her milk to a, an adult male that was in the house but that's an exception for that individual. It's not taken as a general rule for the ummah. So they just observe hijab. When that young man reaches puberty, then the mother has to, uh, or the adopting mother, mother has to make sure she has hijab in front of him. And similarly, 
uh, the girl, she has to wear hijab in front of her adoptive father. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Mr. Adat Abdul Salam, my name. Please, um, there is this disturbing question about um, Ramadan. Pregnant women, they are fast. Some people can't fast. And even after giving birth, they are nursing. They can't still fast. Does, does fidya suffices? That's during Ramadan. You feed a person per day. Because before the other Ramadan comes in, you're still nursing. Probably your body cannot take it again, the fasting. You've tried it and it's not working. Fidya Okay, the um, Sahaba had ruled that a woman uh, who was breastfeeding or a woman uh, who is pregnant would be excused from fasting and that she would not have to make up those days or to feed up a poor person. But it was recommended to feed a poor person for each day. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi I want to know the Islamic ruling. Pardon? For a woman not to work, irrespective of whether the, the husband's husband, the husband's income will be okay for the family for a month. Is it compulsory for a woman not to work? Okay, I'll repeat what was explained to me. Is it okay for a husband to deny the wife the right to work, the right to go out and work, even though he is unable to take care of both of them? Yes, sir. Well... If not being able to take care means you're not being able to put food on the table, then definitely this is not correct. Uh, he should uh, take her help. This is a time of difficulty and it's only a temporary arrangement. He should take her help. You know, otherwise it's going to cause harm to both of them, to children if there are children involved, etc. So it's not... It's not really a wise decision for him to do. Um, this is where you get family involved. You know, your father uh, speaks to him. He, his father speaks to him and advises him. And hopefully, inshallah, he will accept their advice and permit, you to put, permit the woman to work. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. I am Nima Sani. Please, I would like to know what should an aggrieved woman do if in a situation whereby she is tired of the marriage, the husband is also tired of the marriage, but the husband, the husband is refusing to collect back the bride price. What should she do in a situation like that? Okay, let me repeat the question if this is what you are asking. That if a, a woman seeks to or seeks divorce by returning the dowry, because that's normally what is required, return the dowry to her husband, he doesn't agree to accept it. Uh, what should she do? Well, the court should should can and should intervene to uh, see that he does receive the money and let her go he cannot prevent her from leaving by not accepting the money so if the court takes it and he says i don't want it then it can be given away in charity and she can go Is that the last question? As 
Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, this is Hassan Salman. Um, my question has just been asked. But the second question is, in a situation whereby the sister is oppressed and she wants to leave, but she's not granted divorce by the husband, just like the way you just answered it. But from what, from the past lectures we've had, that um, the imam of the area or the scholars around should be invited. But in the situation whereby they are not available, maybe where they live, they are not available, what should be the ground of that sister? That's the number one question. The second question is... No, no, just let me deal with the first question. Okay, in the case of Khula, uh, where a woman wants to return the dowry uh, and there is no court or scholars available, judges available to handle the case, then she has to go to another part of the country where there are scholars because you do have Sharia courts here in some states, etc then she has to go and do it through them. Yeah, the second question is, in this, in the in an environment, most of us now in Egypt, where we cannot find somebody to feed during the month of Ramadan for the sisters that are pregnant or breastfeeding. Some of, some of us live in the estates. We cannot easily find somebody to feed. What would be the situation in that case? Because after like two years before they could fast, maybe pregnant and breastfeeding at the same time. So what would they do? If you can't find somebody to feed in your area, I'm sure there are people who can be fed in other areas. You know? So I, I don't think that's really a problem. There are poor people everywhere. So you just need to go find them. Right? Right? Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa Sorry, please. I think that's the end of the questions. Sorry about that. The people that asked questions, please come down. Those that asked. We have um, at ABC. We have Bashira, we have Rahma, we have Safiya, we have Zainab, Hafsa, Ni'ma, and I think there are those that we could not get your names. The other one, you did not say your name, Azam. while the other one was quiet. Yeah. So you come down for those who asked questions. Rahma. Getting books. Book on Qadr, right? Naam. Yeah, this is a book on Qadr, which is part of the course for Islamic studies in the Islamic Online University. We still had four people. Please come and get it. The four who asked questions. Still two. There's one more. That person leave. Okay. 
It's yours. Assalamu alaikum. I'm a Premier Rukia Tajude. I picked up a, a baby about three years ago, she be three years now, and uh, it was abandoned near my house. And uh, we picked the baby to the police station. That was after taking the child to the hospital for a checkup and everything. And the baby is okay. So we now went to, uh, my husband and I now went to proceed to the police station to report this is what happened and everything like that. And uh, since then, we've just been carrying legal step bit by bit. But we went round saying uh, maybe somebody abandoned the baby or forgot something, but up to now, nobody has come up to own up to the baby to claim the child. And uh, it's growing up, and uh, because of that stigma, I know that he's not mine, and I didn't breastfeed. Taking him to the uh, school has really been like a uh, thing I'm be shying away or from for a while now, but he has to go to hospital, uh, to school, I mean, because he sees my children going to school, and he will say, ah, I want to go with sister, with dad, I'm going to go to him. No, you should, to you, should, uh, you should take what him to I school. What do I do about the son's name? Can he bear my husband's son's name? That's just the problem I'm having. No, he can't bear your surname. And he can't bear my husband's no. son's name. No. So we just, we just, I, we just, we birthed him as a Muslim child, and we it, just gave him the name. Yeah. And that's what we've been calling him. But the other problem is just the surname. Surname, you can call him Abdullah. Just, okay. Okay, so. Okay, there was just one last question uh, brought up. How long after separation, when a man and woman have been separated, uh, how long, if they're separated, how long would it take for the marriage to be considered over? Some people say if it's four months, but actually... What will need to be done? If the separation, both are present, then it should be turned into a divorce. The woman can uh, apply to the court to seek a divorce because it shouldn't really remain as separation. If he has gone to another country, you haven't heard from him, etc., then this can be reported to the court and uh, you can be considered abandoned as an abandoned woman, the court can issue a uh, divorce for you or uh, what they call annulment of your marriage. Inshallah. Love.